and welcome to this introduction to organizations. In this presentation, I'm going to be looking at types of organization, mission and vision, objectives, smart objectives, and stakeholders. So let's kick off with types of organization. Now, there are two main ways to classify an organization. They can be private or they can be public. If an organization is private, what that means is it's owned by private individuals, whereas if it's public, it's owned by the state. So let's dig in and have a look at private organizations first of all. When we have a, a private organization we say it's operating in the private sector and within the private sector you can have organizations that are run uh, not-for-profit such as charities, co-ops and clubs or you can have for-profit organizations such as companies. For-profit organizations have two choices when it comes to their structure. They can be unincorporated or they can be incorporated. An unincorporated organization might be something like a sole trader. Let's imagine a plumber goes into business for himself. He doesn't need to create any kind of company. He can just go out and work for himself and bill and pay his taxes as a sole trader. Or he could go into partnership with a friend or a family member. Now an unincorporated organization means that the finances of the owner and the business are exactly the same. If the plumber's business goes into debt, it means the plumber is now in debt. It means that the plumber will have to pay back the business debts out of the money that he also needs for his mortgage and his family and his food. Okay, so that's what an unincorporated organization is. Now an incorporated organization is when you would create a legal entity to carry your business profit and loss and it keeps them separated from your own personal finances. So the first of these might be a private limited company where all the shares in the organization are privately held and can't be sold on the stock market. And then there's a public limited company and that's when the shares can be sold on the stock market. Now we talk about a private limited company and a public limited company. Well, what's the limited business? Well, it's all about your own personal liability as an owner. If you put in a hundred pounds to start your business, if your business becomes insolvent, your liability to pay back those debts is limited to how much you put into that 100 pounds. So that's the private sector. Now, if we look at the public sector, we're in a very different situation. In the public sector, of course, we can still have for-profit organisations like a state-run company, telecoms or rail or something. More normally, we'll see non-profit organisations such as government departments, such as the environment department. So those are the main types of organisation. Now, why do these organisations exist? What's the point of them? Well, that's where we need to look at mission and vision. What is a mission exactly? Well, it's a bit as it sounds. It helps to provide a common purpose, a focus for your strategy, and a direction for your company's or your organization's objectives. A common purpose means that everyone is clear about what they're doing, why they're there, what the purpose of the company is and what they're moving towards. It helps form the company's culture. The focus for the strategy, well that just means that when you're making strategic decisions you can measure them against the mission and say does this strategy help us achieve the mission. The direction for objectives is similar. It ensures the activities that you're doing to meet your objectives are actually consistent with the purpose of the company, the mission. So that's what the mission is. So let's have a look and see how that might work out in practice. Let's take an example. Bob's Lunchbox is a sandwich shop. And its mission is now going to be set against Campbell's four key elements of good mission statements. Here they are, down the side here, purpose. That's why does the organisation exist and for whom? Strategy. That's how is the organisation going to compete? And policies. This is all about the rules people are expected to follow in order to get them to that place. And then the values is all about what the organisation stands for. So it might be quality or value for money. What do we mean by all that? Well, let's have a look and see what Bob's got in his mission statement. His mission is to become the UK's most loved lunchtime destination by making quality sandwiches filled with local organic produce for Britain's busy professionals. So if we look at the colour coding here, I've picked out in purple the purpose. The purpose, the reason why the organisation exists, is to become the UK's most loved lunchtime destination. Strategy is the way he's going to get that done by making quality sandwiches. The policies, 
are the rules and regulations it's going to follow in order to get that done and it means here in green he's going to use only local organic produce. Now you'll notice that some of these actually cross over. You could argue that making quality sandwiches is also part of the purpose. When it comes to the values it wasn't possible to colour things twice but what we can pull out from the mission statement is that Bob's Lunchbox values quality that's written in there and it also values local produce rather than globally sourced produce and organic produce rather than factory produce so those are values we can infer from the mission statement some organizations go even further and put their values in a separate value statement so what would a good mission statement contain well it would be clear and unambiguous it would be concise it will cover the whole organization and it would be open-ended, not quantifiable, not something you can measure. Okay, that's what a mission statement is. Now, how does that differ from a vision? Well, a vision is about the kind of future you want to create. It's where the company would like to be in the future if all goes to plan. It's not a promise and it's not a contract and it's not a roadmap. It's an idea of the future. So let's have a look and see how that would work in practice. Here's Bob's mission statement to become the UK's most loved lunchtime destination by making quality sandwiches filled with local organic produce for Britain's busy professionals. That's the mission. Now the vision statement is going to be slightly different because he's looking ahead. The idea is that he's going to have a successful chain of sandwich shops throughout the UK serving quality sandwiches to Britain's busy professionals. So it's his vision of a future state. Okay, so that's the difference between the mission and the vision. Now having a mission and a vision is great, but how are you going to get there? Well, that's where objectives come in. And where mission statements and vision statements are deliberately non-quantifiable, in other words, it provides an overall direction, and objectives is where you get specific, okay? We need to be able to measure success, and that's what objectives are all about, okay? So let's see how it all works out. Now, bear with me on this one because there's a lot of triangles and arrows and little bits and bobs, but the concept is very simple. There's a hierarchy of objectives and they're set at different levels of an organization. Okay, let's have a look and see how it works out. Let's call this our organization. We've got the corporate objectives at the top. Uh, we've got the business unit objectives below it, the functional and operational objectives below that, and then it comes down to the individual themselves. Okay, so when we talk about vertical consistency of objectives, what we mean is the lower levels contribute to the one above. Okay, so let's say Bob has five stores. If the total profit objective is one million pounds, then each store's objective has to be £200,000. Next, we have horizontal consistency of objectives. And what that means is that the objectives of different departments, individuals or businesses within the corporate structure should be consistent with each other. And that enables coordination within the organisation. So, for example, if Bob's central sandwich making group's target is 20,000 units or sandwiches a day, then each store has to contribute 4,000 a day. Okay, now that's not the only way that objectives can be consistent. We also have time-based consistency. And what that means is that short periods contribute to a long-term goal. So, for example, your six-month target 500,000 is contributing to your one year's target of 1 million. Okay, so that's objectives. So how can we tell if the objectives that we've set are going to be effective at getting us what we need? Well, there's an easy way to do it. Effective objectives are always smart. They are specific. Don't make me guess what you need. Tell me precisely what you need. Then you'll have some chance of actually getting it. So about a clear focus topic, profit, sales, customer satisfaction, that sort of thing. Next, they should be measurable. Otherwise, we won't know when we've been successful. OK, so you must be able to measure the objectives such as turnover from new products launched, something like that. They must be achievable. There's no point in setting an objective that isn't achievable. It only demotivates your staff. They must be relevant. There's no point asking the sales director to reduce the number of manufacturing defects. It's not relevant to that person and their job. 
Lastly, they must be time bound. There's no point saying to the company, you must all achieve a certain level of turnover. Well, by when? If we've got two years to do it, it's much easier than if we've only got a couple of months to do it. So what if Bob decided to create an objective under his new chain store strategy? He's going to increase turnover by 50% or more over 24 months by opening one new store in any town in the next 12 months. Is this a smart objective? Well, is it specific? Well, yes, he's going to increase turnover by 50% or more uh, in 24 months by opening one new store in any town. So it's very specific on all fronts. Is it measurable? Yes, because we've said 50%, so we can measure whether he gets there or not. Okay, is it achievable? Well, I think that by doubling the number of sales outlets you've got, in theory, you could double your turnover. But in reality, it would take Bob a little while probably to get sales in a new store to the level of his established store. So giving himself two whole years to get half as much, I think is eminently achievable. Is it relevant? Well, clearly it's relevant because it's about his own company and his own people. Is it time bound? Yes, he's given himself 24 months to do it. So actually Bob's objective is quite smart and achievable. So that's how you or Bob or anyone can get their objectives to be effective by making them smart. Now we don't create strategies, missions, visions and objectives in a vacuum. They affect people and the people that are affected by our business decisions are called stakeholders. And if we want to be successful, then we need to know how to classify and satisfy our different stakeholders. So let's classify first of all. We can have internal stakeholders. These are stakeholders that are residing within the organisation. So it's going to be people like managers and employees. Then we have connected stakeholders. These are stakeholders who are outside the business, but still closely connected to it, such as customers or shareholders. Then lastly, we have the external stakeholders. Now, this is a wider set of stakeholders that sit outside the business and are not closely connected with the company's core offering. So these could be government departments, they could be community or pressure groups, okay? So those are our stakeholder classifications. Next, we need to be able to map the level of power and interest a stakeholder has in our organization. We do this using Mendelo's matrix. Now, hold on a minute, I hear you cry. Why, again, are we mapping power and interest? Well, it's like this. If you have a stakeholder who puts up their hand and says, I need you to do everything very differently to please me, well, you could expend a lot of effort getting things right for this particular squeaky wheel. But if that stakeholder doesn't actually have any power to influence your business or doesn't have really that much interest in how well your business does, you're not really focusing your efforts in the right people. You really want to be focusing more of your efforts on the people who have a lot of power over your business or have a lot of interest in the outcome of your business. On the vertical axis of this matrix, we map power low and high. And then on the horizontal axis, we map interest, the kind of interest that the stakeholder has in the organization, low and high again. So let's see how that will work out in practice by looking uh, at the top left corner with low power and low interest. This is where you would exert minimal effort because this person can't really do anything to you and they're not really that interested in you either. And so it might be something like part-time staff who come in on Saturday, they don't have any power and they don't really have that much interest, they're just there for a short time. So you'd exert minimal effort to satisfy that stakeholder. Next you have the kind of stakeholder that has low power but high interest. So those might be something like Bob's full-time staff. They're very interested in how the business is going, but they don't have that much power, they're employees. So you want to keep them informed. And this regular communication is going to help retain good relationships with these stakeholders and it avoids them seeking to increase their power. For example, if it's employees, they might seek to increase their power through unionization. Keeping them informed might make them realize they don't really have the problem they thought they had and help them feel that their needs are being addressed. The next set of stakeholders have high power but low interest. They might be something like uh, a regulator, a government regulator. You need to keep these stakeholders satisfied. The needs 
of a regulator, for example, are very simple. You need to be compliant with a certain set of regulations. And as long as you are, then that stakeholder is satisfied. And then they won't seek to increase their interest in your organisation. For example, by closing you down or fining you or sanctioning you or limiting your ability to do business. So although this stakeholder doesn't have that much interest in you, they're not going to look at your financial statements, not that interested. If you don't keep them satisfied in the areas where they are interested, then they do have very, very high power to significantly affect your business. Lastly, high power and high interest stakeholders might include the major shareholders of an organization. Well, in Bob's business, it's Bob, isn't it? But in a bigger organization, you might have a group of shareholders. OK, you need to keep these stakeholders very close. So you need to assume that this set of stakeholders are interested in everything that you're doing. So regular communication has to be maintained and their goals and their objectives, their needs are not just entertained, but they're included as part of the strategy setting process and your whole business approach. So now when we're forming new strategies, we can use our matrix to work out which of our stakeholders' interests we need to try and incorporate into our strategy and which we can probably leave to one side. So that's how you'd use Mendelo's matrix to map the power and interest of stakeholders and work out what level of satisfaction you should give them. But how would you actually satisfy stakeholders and what happens when your interests do not agree with those of the stakeholders. And then you get a stakeholder conflict. So let's run down some stakeholder needs. On the left hand side here we've got managers for example and they need efficiency savings. We've got employees, they've got a desire for job security and wage increases. So the manager here might think well it would be much more efficient if we could get one person to do two people's jobs, we could let someone go. But obviously the employees, their interest is in conflict with the interest of the manager because they want to keep their job. And actually they'd rather get paid more than actually see themselves lose their job. In the next row we've got shareholders. Now they want to see profitability levels and good dividend return. But that's different to those of the customers. The customers want to see product and service quality. But those needs are in conflict again because the more you invest in product quality and service quality well the less money you have left to divvy out to shareholders so profitability goes down so the needs of those two different sets of stakeholders again are in conflict then lastly in the bottom row we have shareholders and community now shareholders want to see profitability levels and good dividend return but the community want to see an investment in the community, such as reducing pollution or waste disposal. So the conflict here is very much like the previous one. You've got the community saying, we'd like you to invest in you know, something for the community, but the shareholders are saying, no, no, we'd like you to divvy that money up to us, give it to us, return it to us. We want a return on our investment. We want to see your company more profitable. You're just wasting your money building parks for people. So <laughs> those different sets of stakeholders, again, are in conflict. OK, so that's the theory of it. We can see how conflicts arise. Let's have a look and see how you could resolve some of this. We'll use an example to go through it. Let's say Bob is worried that they're overstaffed in one of the shops and he's proposing to make one full-time employee redundant. Now the employees are all unhappy because they, no one wants to be the one who's made redundant and also feel that with one less employee the shop is going to be understaffed. So that's a stakeholder conflict. How would you move to a resolution here? Well, Sight and March came up with four different ways that a company can resolve stakeholder conflicts. The first is satisficing. And this means uh, holding negotiations between your key stakeholders and arriving at some kind of accepted compromise. So, for example, in our Bob example, Bob and the employees meet and decide to reduce all the employees' hours instead of making one of them redundant. The next is sequential attention and what this means is you're going to take turns to focus on the needs of different stakeholder groups one at a time so for example this employee is not made redundant but the agreement is made that next time that redundancies need to be made it will be from that shop and the idea is the needs of the employees are met this time but next time a different stakeholders needs are going to be met 
in this instance it will be Bob's needs. Side payments is a way of basically paying off the stakeholder who has the conflict. So, for example, if you need to let someone go, then you pay them off with a redundancy package, and that goes some way to compensating the fact that they didn't get their need met. Lastly, you can have the exercise of power, and that's basically when you use your power to force through a decision whether people like it or not. So, for example, in our Bob example, it may be that all the employees are unhappy. Well, too bad, Bob's going to let someone go anyway, and they'll just have to deal with it. It's not necessarily the most motivational option because Bob's failed to consider the needs of any stakeholder except himself. And unfortunately, he can't run his chain of sandwich shops or on his own. So that's stakeholders and that is an introduction to organisations. We looked at types of organisation, private and public. We looked at mission and vision. We looked at objectives and the hierarchy of objectives. And we looked at how to make objectives effective using the SMART model. And then lastly, we looked at stakeholders, the people that have interest and influence and power over the decisions we make in our organisations.